So I'm Malcolm Napier. Um, I'm from a small company called Empirical that's based on the uh, campus of Reading University. And I'm uh, here to talk about uh, RepRap, which is an open source 3D printer, which I'm guessing quite a few of you have seen downstairs in the um, uh, exhibition area, because I'm not sure that I've stopped talking since about half past night. Um, and I'm really pleased so many of you have come for um, what's going to be a bit of a canter through uh, what RepRap's all about. And particularly from the, the perspective of somebody who built one, um, uh, I, I hadn't come at this as a, um, an evangelist or somebody who was in at the, the, the start of the movement. And so I think this is um, a fairly pragmatic view of what it's all about. Uh, I think if, before I start talking about uh, source hardware, just to gauge the people in the audience, how many of you are primarily from a software background? Okay. Uh, how many with primarily an electronics background? And that probably leaves a few who have some sort of hardware background. Uh, okay, so what? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I'm not sure how many of you are aware, but there's actually quite a movement of people who are designing machines which previously used to be commercial. Uh, in the sense that they were governed by some sort of license, copyright, IPR. And uh, uh, people are now building open source model, uh, open source versions of those products, uh, which has some dramatic impacts on cost, availability, etc. I've just picked a few examples here. Uh, that's a, a milling machine, typically used for carving bits of wood. Uh, this is a 3D laser cutter. That's an alternative version of uh, additive 3D printing, which is what a replica machine is uh, from uh, one of the universities in the states. And this is an absolutely wonderful site because does anybody fancy an open source forklift truck? <laughs> <laughs> or a car? Um, or a tractor digger? Um, I really do, if, you, if you've got a few moments, I'd go and look at the uh, open source ecology um, site. But it's, it's an indication that people over the last few years have been designing machines and putting them uh, into the public domain. But then this gentleman, who I would equate to the um, Linus Torvalds of the, um, of the open source hardware world, who has a, a speciality uh, which is really uh, looking at biological methods in, um, in modern technology. One of the, how easy it would be to make a, um, a machine that could make parts to repair of itself, possibly create a new version of itself, and was open source. What sort of Pandora's box would that open? And he managed to get himself a small research grant, it was at the University of Bath, uh, managed to get himself a small research grant to fund a PhD student who designed the first uh, 3D printer. Um, and therefore the RepRap movement was born. And I think that pretty much says what it's about. The key um, point here is fused filament fabrication is the principle of laying down layers of a um, molten material, um, in this case it's plastic, very low melting point, and when you've laid one layer down you then proceed to lay another layer and another layer, so you can build 3D shapes up by a succession of layers, um, and the, the engineering characteristics of both the machine um, and the, uh, the plastic was designed so that it could print as much of itself as possible, but that in financial terms, certainly when we built our first machine, it was about a third of the cost of the machine. The other two, uh, two thirds, a third was the cost of the electronics, and a third was the cost of the motors. And as yet, those two problems haven't been solved, but there are quite a few people particularly working on the area of electronics. So I don't know how long it will be before you can, um, you can print your own electronics using a rep wrap machine. And the thing is, because the, the whole community is open source, there's lots of people innovating, and that ultimately there are no um, licensing intellectual uh, property barriers to entry, there's an implication of reducing the cost of machines, which I'll come on to in a few minutes. Um, but before I do, uh, just a, an acronym slide. Uh, these are all different technologies in which the RepRap uh, printing technologies down the bottom, uh, but these are all different technologies that use 
uh, ways of building up material in 3D. And I'm not sure if you can still see it, but there was a very good program on Flip, the BBC's technology magazine, broadcast on BBC News, uh, that showed you quite a few examples of the, of the different uh, ways of printing, without actually plugging the companies who, who made them. So if you've got a machine that can print itself, the first problem is how do you print the first machine? Uh, and here are a couple of variations on, um, on what people made uh, using non-plastic components, some bits up here that are plastic in the proper machines are a bit tricky to make, but basically lash-ups that enable you to print the first set of plastic parts. And therefore these machines have the name RepStrap, because they're the things you bootstrap from. And technically speaking, the machine that we are showing downstairs is a RepStrap machine. Because we, although we used the designs for the proper machine, uh, our, our plastic parts were laser cut by somebody. So they were, the first set of parts weren't originally printed. Uh, once you've got a RepStrap machine, you can start building and evolving the machines. And these are all versions of RepRaps. Uh, the top uh, right hand corner is, or left hand corner if you guys look at it, is the original version that's called Darwin. And anybody spotting the uh, biological evolutionists in the names is um, correct because this machine is called Mendel. That, uh, that is really an improvement because the triangulation makes the whole assembly stronger. Uh, this version down here is uh, Huxley, and that is smaller, lighter, much more portable. Uh, and this final version here is uh, called Cruiser, and its claim to fame is that there's been a big simplification of the uh, plastic parts. If you look at the amount of bolts required to hold plastic things together, you can't quite see it here, but this one's a lot, a lot simpler. So we're, we're on generation four, and um, certainly my impression is this is going to be the, um, the standard going forward. And I said earlier about prices. Um, I researched this slide in June, and the uh, machines at the top left hand corner are commercial machines, um, printing using the same sort of technology with a similar sort of print volume. I mean, the, our Mendel can print about 7 inches by 7 inches by 7 inches, and these are comparable machines. And these are actual prices. So if you went to a supplier of Stratasys machines, they'd be quoting 17 to thereabouts to buy one of their machines. Uh, the HP is significantly cheaper at 11. Um, the American Fab at Home, uh, I think it's Cornell University that comes from, which is an open source design, uh, just not self replicating. If you wanted to bring one into the UK, it would cost you um, about £2,000, I guess, with import tax. Maybe a bit over. Um, and the only wrap wrap kit that I could find available to buy on the website at that time uh, was from Germany. It was a shade under 900 euros. So you can see the, the impact that the change in price is having to the effect that you can begin to conceive that you know, every home could have one, just like every home pretty much has got an inkjet printer. A uh, slight diversion to the community. Uh, these are people who we've come across in the last year or so, sometimes more, uh, in terms of uh, they've helped us, they participate in the community very actively. Um, Adrian Boyer, he invented the thing. Uh, we went to see him do a presentation in Cardiff last year. He had his rep wrap machine on the table, printed something up while he was talking. Um, I think to me he's still the master. Uh, just to show this is not completely UK based, we've got uh, Vic Oliver who I think has been involved in the for four or five years, contributed to a lot of the early discussions in the designs. Um, there's a bloke who, I, I love his picture um, and his handle, uh, not head, but he's um, Mr Precision. If you want to find somebody who's got the best quality prints going, uh, my guess is he's going him. Uh, Joseph, Bruce, uh, well, it's called the Bruce Amendment because he's designed all the parts to simplify it. And uh, this guy down here, Jean Marc Gifford, um, he's uh, recently undertaken one of the crowdsource funding ideas and he's raised several hundred uh, thousand dollars to do a 
now. So you, you can you can get things wrong quite easily and you've got to prepare to write stuff off. And then fine-tuning does take an awful long time. So then we built our printer. How do we um, get some things to, uh, to demonstrate what a clever device it is? Well, there are three broad ways. Uh, there's this wonderful website called Thingiverse, which is um, uh, a site where people upload designs they've made, and particularly if you're looking for better designs and parts for your printer, or you're looking for cool things to print, uh, that's the place to go in the first instance. Um, you can design uh, objects yourself. Uh, Google SketchUp is a possibility. Uh, we generally use a program called OpenSCAD, and we were given a uh, design to print out today, uh, which has been generated in Blender. It was the logo. Uh, for OCCAM, but um, we weren't able to print it out because the, uh, the, the object itself didn't have proper integrity, so when we tried to convert it, it uh, reckoned to got open polygons. Uh, but you can spend as long as you like, and there will be people who only want to design them to, uh, to have the machines to print them. And then you can add commercial, AutoCAD, and a whole raft of other stuff. The key point about anything you do a design is you need to be able to get your 3D object out of excuse me, as a .stl file, uh, because that's an import. And then finally you can scan things, and scanning them, uh, we've demonstrated a turntable scan here, uh, but we're hooking up to some of the Brian Maker Fair in a couple of weeks' time, um, who's had to connect. And I think it's only a matter of time before Connect becomes the de facto uh, scanning technology. Um, so in terms of print sequence, you need to get the object that you want and you need to get it into an STL file. You're then well advised, and this is where our old camp logo fell over, to check the STL file, uh, because if in any way it's uh, not a perfect 3D object, you can freak the uh, conversion program out. You then convert it to this language called G-code, which is the standard language for computer-aided machining, and send it off to the printer. Um, G-code is what the printer understands. It will do the rest. So, just about to time. Um, what are we going to do next? Well, our interest is very much in um, local communities or clusters, and we are um, busy trying to get several things off the ground in the Thames Valley area, so for those of you who are local, uh, we'd be delighted to hear from you as a result of, uh, of this. Um, we're also in two weeks' time going down to the Brighton Mini Maker Fair, where we're going to hook up with this guy with the uh, Connect Scanner, and he's apparently enabling people to design things by waving their arms in the air. And what we will do is take the STL files that we produce us, and we'll print them out for people to take home. And we're going to do a fair small because that way we've got a chance of getting the forty people walking out to make a pair of objects that design and connect. And then as we get into uh, October, um, we've got a friend who's a potter, and we're going to have a play to swap our melting plastic head out and replace it with something that will extrude clay, so that she can design. And we need her. We could, this is not something we could ever contemplate doing. We need her because she understands how to mix clay up with the right consistency. And of course, you've got killing to bake it once we've, um, once we've got something nice. So, 20 minutes. Canter through 3D printing. We're downstairs for as long as it takes today, but we're not here tomorrow. So if you, uh, if you do want to have a look and you haven't already done so, uh, please feel free to pop down. And I'll let next questions.
and the, yeah, you spend a week trying to keep the documentation up to date. I think, and, uh, so. yes. um, with normal printers, the killer cost is unique. Uh, what's the cost of the plastic? We paid about 80 euros for five kilos of um, PLA. Um, so yeah, that's that's a sort of reasonable. You can pay a few more from China, you can get it cheaper than that, but you have to buy a lot more. Um, that has kept us printing for four months and we're about two thirds of the way through the year. Um, I don't sense them, I mean, don't forget, uh, this, these machines are not built by people who are trying to operate a razor blade model on it. Um, so they're not giving you the printer and then just thinking you for the cost of the consumables. The, the whole thing is cost plus whatever administration, uh, the economies of scale. So I, I think it's unbelievably reasonable for um, it may change. Yes. What would you say is the hard part of it? I'll definitely calibrate it because I'm pretty sort of high quality. Um, I don't know if I can go back here. So um, we've had two goes. Um, the the RepRAM program itself, the RepRAM project provides software, which also is called RepRAM. Um, and that will undertake this conversion. And we spent a amount of time playing with that and didn't have a, a terrific amount of success. We then moved over to a piece of software called Scanform, which is um, uh, Python based. And there's a lot of configuration. I mean, effectively, you have to con configure that piece of software to your machine. So there aren't only general settings, but there are settings that reflect how much. Um, backlash your own to the machine has. So you have to configure all that into a file, which then goes into production with new code, and that's an interesting process and takes quite a long time. Uh, What's the most interesting thing to be made for it so far? Uh, I actually think the, uh, we've printed a couple of, they're called tornado shapes, and they're a single filament wide, and they're very, uh, they start off narrow and build out. And they're in irregular shape and then to mimic the shape of a tornado. Um, and they're one example of pushing a couple of extremes of the machine. One is it's only one filament wide. And the other thing is it builds out and the, the shapes show you the limits of how far you can print out paper without having to use support material. Um, and when you've actually printed one out and you feel the um, it's actually surprisingly strong. Um, we haven't got, I mean, we, we've mainly been printing bits from our other machines, which are uh, quite boring and razor charge all you can ever use it for is printing. But we, we've got a few examples downstairs of a lot of people would be quite taken with a, we've built a roller bearing completely out of plastic. Uh, so the two races and the balls are all printed as one job. Um, and we've, I've actually got three or four repair jobs that are slightly done fairly soon. Um, I'm a software engineer. Return to you, there are Euro services, shape ones, for example. There's a big European um, attempt to become the Amazon of 3D part provision. They've got a massive installation, they've got lots of machines of the variety with all the acronyms I said earlier on. Um, if you uh, want to get parts quickly, then there are, for, to make your own handout, there are probably half a dozen trusted people you would go to, most of whom are listed on that slide. Um, they will, I mean, we asked for a part from uh, Chris Palmer, not Ed. We got it back uh, three days later uh, for uh, cost of about six quid in the postage. And that was for the extruder body, uh, which is quite a complicated piece. Um, there's a forum which gives you clues as to who are reputable, etc. And I'd like to think before too long we'll be in that group as well. Um, so, get yeah, a business card for the I've got a couple of minutes, so I've got to do two more questions. Is there any size restriction? 
Yeah, the physical size of objects in one print job um, is approximately on average 7 by 7 by 7. Um, it's slightly affected by the design of the machine and particularly the print head that we use. Uh, if you want to go bigger than that, then print several parts out and put them together using SSO. Final question. Okay. Is there any potential to add something to make the difference? So you can add things and then. No. Uh, the first point is plaster plastic has a low melting temperature. You use it in the machine, it goes all blurry and you don't get any consistency. If you want to mill real stuff, then the frame is not strong enough to take the forces in milling uh, in printed circuit boards generally. Yeah. So we're looking to build a different machine to the printed circuit boards. One more? No? That's it. Sorry, we're.